All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about a history of models of the atom. So a history of atomic theory. And we're really talking about theories of the internal structure of atoms mostly. But of course, we need to start somewhere. So we're going to begin with the very first idea of atoms. And that's going to take us back to ancient Greece. Now, the idea behind this whole presentation is that there's been several famous or celebrated experiments or ideas uh, throughout history which have shaped atomic theory and it also illustrates well just how science works there are working theories that are based on the data we have available and eventually new data becomes available which renders the theory obsolete or needed to be revised um, but of course some of that process is really about the scientific method and we're going to start well before the scientific method is really established. But as we go through the centuries, you'll see how scientific theories develop and how scientific progress is made. Um, beginning with ancient Greece, where really we're talking about philosophy more than science. And so I'll begin by illustrating two Greek philosophers who ideas, whose ideas are kind of opposed to each other because Aristotle will learn is uh, going to be the name we associate with the idea of elements, whereas Democritus um, and sometimes Leucippus is another person who's associated with the idea of atoms. Those seem, um, right now, of course, we know that they can both be unified in the same theory, but at the time, these are really sort of diametrically opposed ideas. So here's how I'd like to summarize this in our notes. This is first going to start with... Uh, a name, and that is Aristotle, and then a year, approximately 400 BC, and don't quote me on that, but that's the general date range for uh, ancient Greece philosophy. Ancient Greece philosophy. Um, and we're going to associate Aristotle with the idea of elements. In other words, the idea that the universe is composed of just a few elements. And these are usually described as earth, air, fire, and water, although Aristotle also is purported to have um, suggested an element called ether. Um, but the idea of elements that Aristotle suggested was really that everything could be described in terms of elements. In other words, things like wood would be certain parts earth, certain parts fire, and certain parts water. And things like metal would be different number of parts earth and a different number of parts water or fire, but there are really only four fundamental substances in nature. Now that idea was um, opposed by Democritus, whose idea of atoms um, incorporated um, this idea that atoms were unbreakable particles. And there are some analogies that um, he's said to have made. One of them, and we're going to write his name down with the same year, Democritus. Um, it said that Democritus looked at a beach from up on a clifftop and said, if you look at the beach, it looks like it is one continuous uniform substance from a great distance. But when you get down onto the beach, you'll see that it's actually made of tiny little particles, tiny little grains. Well, perhaps an individual grain of sand is the same way. It looks uniform from a distance, but when you get up close, perhaps it's also made of tiny little particles. And the idea of atoms, which really comes from the Greek word for unbreakable, is that all matter is made of tiny, unbreakable particles. And this is very different than Aristotle's idea, which is more about um, elements having a certain essence, um, as opposed to being particulate in nature, they really are kind of essential in nature. And these are really philosophies. Um, and that's how we're going to summarize uh, each of the names we go through today is just with a name, a date, and a key idea that's associated with each. Democritus uh, proposed that perhaps salt was cubic because the particles it was made of were little cubes, and that water flowed because the particles it was made of were round, and that iron was rigid because the particles it was made of were spiky. So both of these um, 
philosopher has sort of introduced important ideas to our modern understanding, but it really wasn't um, for quite a, uh, about 2,000 years later that the uh, two ideas of elements and atoms were unified. And jumping through 2,000 years is a huge jump. Um, and I think it's important to talk about the many, many advances that were made in the Islamic world and in China and Europe um, over those two millennia. But um, many of those ideas advanced chemistry, um, but did not necessarily in advance um, atomic theory. So what are celebrated as the four great inventions in China. And of course, the word chemistry comes from the word alchemy, just like algebra comes from algebra. So a lot of um, advances in chemistry made in other uh, areas that weren't really about atomic structure. But since our focus is atomic structure, we're going to jump straight to this British school teacher who around the year 1800 developed the first atomic theory. So let's put his name in our notes next. And his name is John Dalton. And the year that we're going to put um, behind John Dalton's name is 1803. So that's uh, a time when he published some of his ideas. And this gentleman was a teacher who sort of um, unified the ideas of elements and atoms and um, brought together the idea of elements with the idea of atoms. So sort of, um, first of all, stating that all matter is indeed made of atoms, but there are different types of atoms called elements and that atoms combine in simple whole number ratios like H2O is 2H's 1O and so on. So he did a little bit of uh, work with chemical reactions as uh, describing them as just a rearrangement of atoms as well and that's often included as a fourth part of his law but we're just talking about atomic structure right now so we won't include that piece about um, atoms being rearranged in chemical equations or chemical reactions. So let's move on and talk about the next person who advances the theory of the atom. And we'll write 1906 as the year that's associated with J.J. Thompson's work. And there's a couple of bullets that we're going to add underneath his name. And you'll notice that we're going 100 years forward now. And we're going to add his name below that of John Dalton. So. Dalton, we can think of as advancing the first atomic theory, which incorporated atoms and elements. But at this point in time in uh, the development of atomic theory, we really don't have any um, ideas about the internal structure of atoms themselves. We've just determined that atoms of different elements exist. So this is where J.J. Thompson, the first uh, contribution uh, we're going to discuss to the internal structure of atoms comes up. And we're going to note that J.J. Thompson did experiments with something called cathode rays. And he is credited with the discovery of the electron. And his experiments with cathode rays led him to propose what is known as the plum pudding model of the atom. And this is something that, of course, will need some explanation. So he experimented with cathode rays to discover that atoms must have negatively charged particles, which he named electrons, and proposed a model of the atom, which I'll explain now. So first of all, what are these cathode ray experiments? Well, essentially, if we have a gas at very low pressure sealed in glass, and we have metal disks connected to a voltage source, so essentially a battery, then he noticed that these rays of light would appear as electrons were uh, moving, or what he didn't know were electrons at the time, but when particles were moving from one metal plate to another. But even more interesting, when he held a magnet up to these, then he saw that ray was deflected. And since the magnet that he's holding close to these rays induces an electric field, 
we note that the electric field is essentially causing electrons to be repelled um, away from the negative field um, that he's generated. So that means there must be some sort of negative particles inside atoms. And if there are negative ones, there must be positive ones too. But it seems like these negative ones can move around. So we think about J.J. Thompson experiments as showing the existence of electrons. Where in the atom are they? Well, he just assumed that most of the atom was basically a positively charged sort of matrix or pudding. And that the electrons, since we were able to get them to move, must be like little raisins in the pudding or little plums that could be dislodged. And this explained the conduction of electricity, although it did it by referencing a British dessert. So nobody was really that happy with this explanation, I imagine. But this is a model of the atom which was accepted at the time when it was first published. He thought that there was basically a bunch of positive stuff, that the atom was mostly positive mass with removable electrons, and that the atom's positive mass was spread out all throughout the atom. But of course, we know that the mass of the atom is concentrated in the nucleus, and so is the positive charge. And this idea of a nucleus was not part of Thompson's model. It was actually his student named Ernest Rutherford who is credited with the discovery of the nucleus. So we're going to put this in our notes next. Let's talk about Ernest Rutherford. And Ernest Rutherford was actually a New Zealander and was a, there we go, Ernest Rutherford. Um, a student of Thompson's, and he is credited with the discovery of the nucleus, which he discovered by conducting a very famous experiment known as the gold foil experiment. And we'll need to explain that in a moment. And the discovery of the nucleus is what he is credited with and what's associated with this experiment. So, when he discovers that the mass and positive charge of the atom must be located in a nucleus, he, of course, suggests what we call the nuclear model of the atom. And that's the idea that we've got a dense core where the positive charge is. So, J.J. Thompson's experiment um, is um, what wins him the Nobel Prize in 1906. And you can see that two years later, Ernest Rutherford receives the Nobel Prize for essentially disproving his predecessor's experiment. So things are now moving a little bit more quickly in the world of atomic theory. Let's talk about what this gold foil experiment um, involved. Rutherford's experiment essentially involved taking positive charges and firing them at gold atoms, which seems a little strange, but I want to explain that the positive charges were really um, the nuclei of helium atoms, which we'll learn later are called alpha particles, and those can be emitted by uranium. And he fired them at a sheet of gold, which can be made into a very, very thin, thin uh, foil. So when you get gold foil, it's such a thin layer of gold atoms that his idea was that the alpha particles should pass right through the gold foil. If Thompson's plum pudding model was correct, then that thin layer of gold foil should not be enough to block the alpha particles. But to his surprise, some of those alpha particles bounced back. That means they must have been hitting something like the nucleus. So you'll see many different animations and ideas that depict this uh, experiment. But essentially, here's the gold foil, and the electrons are going to be fired through the gold foil, and he expected all of them to pass right through. He could actually detect where those alpha particles are landing because of this fluorescent screen that's behind the foil. And afterwards, he noticed that not all of them were passing through, but instead many of them were deflected, um, and some of them bounced right back. And the analogy he made was it was like firing a mortar at a tissue paper and having it bounce right back to you.
So he reasoned that there must be a dense core of positive charge at the center. Um, and that's what's causing the alpha particles to sometimes be deflected. So the Thompson model would have suggested the alpha particles go right through because the mass and positive charge are spread out in the plum pudding. But the Rutherford model suggested that the mass and positive charge is actually concentrated in the center. So the plum pudding model with diffuse mass and charge is rejected and it's replaced by the nuclear model um, because of this one experiment. And this is an important idea that science will reject theories that are widely accepted when there is evidence to suggest a, a different theory uh, is needed. So here, experimental evidence show that the Thompson model couldn't possibly be valid. So let's talk about the very last person whose name we're going to include in these notes. And it's a familiar name because this is one we talked about earlier in the unit, and that's Niels Bohr. So Niels Bohr is a colleague of Albert Einstein and wins the Nobel Prize in 1922 for, first of all, the planetary model of the atom. And then second of all, um, we want to understand that he's considered sort of the father of quantum mechanics or quantum theory because he suggested that electrons can only have certain quantities of energy. Um, so let's, let's summarize what Bohr's uh, famous for. First of all, um, Niels Bohr is a Danish physicist who wins the Nobel Prize in 1922. And what he is known for is, first of all, the planetary model of the atom. And this is what we drew at the beginning of this unit. I think when we drew electrons like this orbiting the nucleus of a lithium atom. And you still see, of course, the general drawing of an atom look like this, kind of the symbol for nuclear energy. And he suggested that electrons orbit the nucleus the way planets orbit the sun. Well, that isn't quite right. And he needed to revise his model a little bit later to uh, incorporate this idea of quantum mechanics. And we can think about this as the quantum mechanical model um, of the atom or quantum theory. The idea that electrons can only occupy certain quantities of energy is, of course, what we're representing when we draw Bohr model diagrams, right? So we know that electrons can either reside in this first energy level or they can reside in the second energy level, but they cannot be in between. And that is an idea that many people had trouble with, especially even um, Einstein, his uh, colleague. And Bohr said, it's sort of like um, climbing a ladder. You're either on the second rung of the ladder or you're on the third rung of the ladder. You can't be hovering in between second and third rungs. And Einstein didn't like this and um, suggested that there surely must be a time if you're falling down the ladder that you're halfway in between the second and third rung. Um, after all, if I'm going to drop an object from this height to this height, then doesn't it have to fall through all the intermediate energy states as well? And Bohr said, no, that's how macroscopic objects behave. But it seems like these elementary particles actually just stop being at this energy level and begin being at this energy level, and they never exist in between, which seems very strange. But this has probably been one of the most successful theories in science. And while there's more to this idea than we can um, dive into in this part of our course, we do want to understand that Niels Bohr is the person who's associated with this idea of energy being quantized in electrons and only certain energy levels being allowed. We've referred to them as the first energy level, the second energy level, the third, and so on. We've talked about them as shells, um, and we'll learn later this is called the uh, primary quantum number of an electron. N equals one means the electron's in the first shell. N equals two means the electron is in the second shell. And these correspond to distances from the nucleus. So to summarize, we have 
these names, which we should be familiar with uh, um, regarding the history of atomic structure. Aristotle, whose name is associated with elements, and Democritus, whose name is associated with the idea of atoms. Dalton's atomic theory, which married the idea of both atoms and elements. And then the more modern scientist, J.J. Thompson, experiments with cathode rays, the discovery of the electron and the plum pudding model, Ernest Rutherford, the gold foil experiment, the discovery of the nucleus and the nuclear model. And then finally, we have Niels Bohr, who suggests the planetary model and then later revises the planetary model to incorporate the ideas of quantum mechanics or quantized electron energy.